All right. Well, I think we'll get started here. So welcome, everybody. If you've um, just joined us for our, um, this is our second webinar of the year, and um, it's going to be a great one. Give me a thumbs up, Sarah, if you can hear me okay. Is everything sounding good? Okay, great. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is John Shepard. I am the um, Assistant Director of the Center for Global Environmental Education at Hamlin University. And um, Hamlin University is part of the School of Education and Leadership at Hamlin. Hamlin is, uh, we like to say, we are the oldest university in Minnesota. People at the University of Minnesota kind of quibble with that because they were actually founded before we were, but we graduated the first students. They were both women and they were both teachers. So we're very proud of that. It's part of our heritage. Um, so um, I'm going to kind of get us rolling forward here and just uh, a few reminders as we get started. Uh, we have ways for you to share comments and questions with us, either using the chat or the Q&A functions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you want to share anything about yourself in the chat, where you're from, you know, kind of what your interests are, what brought you to our, um, to our webinar tonight, that would be great. The webinar is being recorded, and uh, within a week or two, you will receive a, a link to the uh, video recording, so you can watch it at your leisure, again, because it's going to be so interesting, you'll want to do that, or share it with your friends. Um, feel free to share uh, broadly. We're interested and excited to be able to, to uh, share this experience with anybody and everybody. Um, so I'm going to kick off with uh, an abridged version of Hamlin University's land acknowledgement statement, which we really take seriously at our center. We do have a real commitment to being very inclusive in our storytelling. We do a lot of storytelling around the country, and um, this is important to us. Hamlin University acknowledges that the land on which we gather and refer to as Minnesota is the traditional and unceded territory of the Dakota and Ojibwe. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters reflect the skies. We pay respect to the citizens, not only of those tribes, but others as well, both past and present, and their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands. <clears throat> A little bit on uh, some of our team. Uh, Tracy Ferdine is our director and, and uh, is also an, is an assistant professor at um, in the School of Education and Leadership. Um, he is not with us tonight, or he, he might be kind of peeking in, but otherwise you won't uh, probably hear from him tonight. Sarah Robert, Robertson is the woman behind the curtain, kind of. She's actually perhaps visible to you now, but she's the one that organizes all this and makes it happen and sends out the notices and so forth. Uh, Chris Bennett. Um, is the director of our K-12 resources program. Um, she's a bit under the weather. She might also be kind of watching from underneath the covers as well. And I introduce myself. Uh, I'm the assistant director, <clears throat> excuse me. And my full-time job is uh, creating educational media resources, um, documentaries and uh, content that we share with multiple audiences all around, all around the country. Um, I will mention our, our mission as a center, uh, which is to instill environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages. So it's a very broad mission. It takes us out uh, outside the university. We're very outward facing. Uh, we do work all around the country and some of it outside the country. Right now we're very active in the Lake Superior, Great Lakes region, which is the focus of our uh, work of our session tonight. We've also have been really active up and down the Mississippi River from the headwaters to the Delta over many years. Uh, we have a big project right now in the Gulf of Mexico, all five Gulf uh, states, creating a large scale learning program on uh, coastal environments. And uh, also in the Hawaiian Islands, we're very active doing uh, education on um, uh, uh, Hawaiian culture, cultural traditions, uh, natural resources, uh, marine uh, environments with uh, working with some federal agencies and a whole bunch of different uh, partners there. So we're kind of all over the place. We're small, but we um, are very active uh, broadly. And that's through wonderful partnerships. And we're 
um, really pleased to be sharing tonight uh, um, some time with you for you to get to know a couple of our partners uh, who you'll be hearing from. Uh, Peter Annan is the director of uh, the Mary Griggs Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation at Northland College, and Jonathan Thunder is a wonderful artist uh, living in Duluth, uh, painter and digital media artist, a mem member of the Red Lake uh, Ojibwe Band. And I'll give a little bit more introduction when they're ready to kick off here. Um, so the, the format for tonight, uh, we're going to have uh, presentations by Peter and by Jonathan, starting with Peter. Uh, each will be half hour ish, something like that. And then uh, I'm going to share a little bit of uh, more information about the work that we are doing uh, with the two of them and others in the Lake Superior region and share some resources that we are developing. Um, and then we'll have a, a Q and a session with with Peter and Jonathan and any questions that, that I might answer as well. Uh, and we'll be for sure done by 7.30, might, you know, might end a little earlier, kind of depending on how long the questions and answers go. So, uh, so that is the, that is the format. Um, so I'm going to, I'll say a little bit more about Peter first. Um, hang on one sec. Let me switch over my notes. Um, so I mentioned that uh, Peter is, is the director of the Mary Griggs Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation at Northland College. Northland College is, is, in Ashland, Wisconsin. He also, uh, he's a writer and journalist by background and training, is the author of Great Lakes Water Wars, which is a definitive book on uh, Great Lakes water diversions, controversies in times past. And he has a new book out, just out, uh, that's called Purified, How Recycled Sewage is Transforming Our Water. Uh, we just did it, we did a book uh, event with Peter at Hamlin, um, just last month. It was fun to be able to uh, share in that project as well. <clears throat> and uh, before coming to Northland, he worked as a reporter with Newsweek. So he has a strong journalism background, um, was the associate director of the Institute for Journalism and Natural Resources, and was managing director of the University of Notre Dame's environment, environment, env excuse me, environmental change initiative. So, um, so that's kind of you know, that's the bullet point biography. What I'm going to do um, to introduce him a little more fully is uh, share with you a clip uh, from our um, documentary that we are just pleased to be celebrating the release of. Um, it's a it's a, a co-production between our center and PBS North in Duluth. And um, the title of the documentary is A Sea Change for Superior. Um, uh, the warming of the, the world's largest lake. And Peter uh, was generous in working with us and shared some really terrific perspective on the, the, the documentary looks at the impact of climate change on Lake Superior. And uh, it's something Peter has been paying close attention to, uh, partly by being someone living on the South Shore of Lake Superior, which has really uh, received some significant impacts uh, from heavy weather events. So I'm gonna share um, a brief clip from the documentary um, that kind of gives you a flavor of, of Peter and his perspective, and then I'm gonna turn it over to him. So put on your seatbelt. What we've seen under climate change is not only is the lake warming, but we're seeing an increase in large storm events. In 2012, we had a 500-year storm event in Duluth, Minnesota. Animals were swimming out of the zoo. You had photos of people in kayaks at ATM machines. It was just an extraordinary storm event that gutted the street system and broke different parts of the sewer system. It was a really extraordinary storm event. Then in 2016, just four years later, and 60 miles to the east on the, along the south shore of Lake Superior, we have a 1,000 year storm event that strikes Ashland, Wisconsin. Blew out federal highways, blew out all sorts of culverts and bridges throughout the area. 
Uh, and then two years later, 2018, we have another 1,000 year storm event that hammers Ashland, Wisconsin again, and then stretches all the way to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and pounds Houghton, Michigan, Hancock, Michigan. And these storm events created sediment plumes that were so large that they're visible from space. These are storms that are only supposed to happen every 500 years, only supposed to happen every 1,000 years because of their severity. And the south shore of Lake Superior had three of them in six years. We felt like we were seeing climate change right before our eyes. Okay, and with that, um, I will be quiet and stop sharing. And Peter, please take it away. All right, great. Thanks, John. Let me uh, do a screen share here. It says, John, it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I'm getting a okay. warning there. Sarah, can you... Can you address that? You try it again. Sure. There we go. Excellent. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, good. Great. Well, again, thanks, Sean, for the kind invitation to join you and congrats again on the launch of the documentary. <clears throat> uh, the thesis of my talk today is that the Lake Superior watershed and other Great Lakes have entered a period of increased climate driven volatility. And that's marked by long droughts and followed by severe wet periods. And we're seeing more extreme weather events like we just saw in that in that video cl clip and more volatile lake levels as well. And so that those extreme weather events and <clears throat> all those uh, incidents that I'm talking about are taxing the region's human and natural infrastructure. And so by natural infrastructure, we're talking about stream banks and shoreline and things like that. And so this volatility um, is really challenging scientists, government officials, and the general public, and we're all still trying to come to grips with this new normal that we're seeing in, in the Great Lakes region. So as we just saw here, uh, I'm just going to recap what we just saw in the video. In 2012, Duluth was hit by this 500-year storm event that washed out roadways, highways, culverts, etc., and then four years after that, we had a thousand year storm event that struck Ashland just 60 miles uh, to the east. And then two years after that, we have this another thousand year storm event that strikes Ashland and moves on to Houghton, Michigan. This is a photo of U.S. Highway 2, which was completely blown out by the storm uh, west of uh, Ashland, Wisconsin in 2018. So as again, as I said in the video, these are 500 year and thousand year storm events. What that means, they're only supposed to happen they're so severe that they only would have happened in the past every 500 to 1,000 years. And so it's just not normal for this kind of storm activity to be happening in such a condensed area uh, or confined area on the south shore of Lake Superior. But increasingly, it seems like this is a new normal uh, on Lake Superior's south shore. And we're in a situation now for the people who live here, we're kind of sort of always watching for these kinds of storm events now from a sort of a little bit of a PTSD uh, from those events. And so again, these storm events are so large that they create sediment plumes that are visible from space. I mentioned that in the video, but we didn't have this kind of a clip. So just to orient you here with the photograph, this is a photo of the west end of Lake Superior down in that far left-hand corner, that's the port of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And then we have, we follow along those sediment plumes all along the south shore of Lake Superior to the Bayfield Peninsula and, and the Apostle Islands, all the way over to the Bad River Reservation. 
uh, close to the right hand, lower right hand side here. And as you can see, um, so we have a lot of clay soils in this part of the state, and you can just see these big storm events have flushed out all sorts of sediment into the lake. And this is, you can see from the photo credit, this is a NASA photo uh, taken from space. On top of that, as the video talks about very clearly, Lake Superior is very well known for its chilly waters. Anyone who has been swimming in the lake knows that that's true. But unfortunately, due to climate change, it is one of the fastest warming large lakes in the world. And uh, this is according to data from the Large Lakes Observatory at the University of Minnesota Duluth and other scientists. And what's more, it, the lake is warming faster than the watershed or the land mass around it. Uh, and what we're also seeing is an increase, a gradual increase in wind speeds on the lake, which is going to be a challenge for all sorts of reasons going forward if that trend uh, continues. So what we see these sediment plumes entering a warming water body, still cold, but a warming water body. So we have these nutrients coming in from the storms and then the warmer water creating these algal blooms. Um, and so Lake Superior has now entered in what we're kind of referring to as the algal bloom era. Many of these big storms produced algal bloom events along the south shore of the lake, which is super unusual for a lake that is so famously clear, deep, and clean. It just, it's a lake that just is not the kind of lake that one would expect algal blooms to um, uh, emerge on. And so it's so unusual that it's garnered the na national attention from news organizations like the New York Times. And as you can see, this is a story following the 2018 storm along the South Shore. And so, but if we wanna talk about algal blooms, and I'm gonna talk about Lake Superior, but I'm also gonna, in this talk, gonna put Lake Superior in a broader um, perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, from the entire Great Lakes watershed. No lake in the Great Lakes system has seen a bigger problem and a bigger challenge with algal blooms than Lake Erie. Lake Erie is the most Southern lake in the watershed. That means it's the warmest lake, it's the shallowest lake, and over time, it has proven itself to be the most vulnerable lake, vulnerable lake because of those attributes. It also has a lot of agriculture on the South Shore in Ohio and Michigan. It also has uh, a lot of agriculture on the North Shore in Ontario, uh, uh, in Canada. And so all that combination with an, also an increase in precipitation and um, uh, storm events, we're seeing... So we have sediment plumes in Lake Superior that are visible from space. Lake Erie, as you can see, has algal blooms that are visible from space. And this has been a consistent problem annually for many, many years now. You can find all sorts of photos like this on the internet. Um, this ha one happens to be from 2011, uh, but they're, they're, the blooms are happening annually. And it's a really sign, it's a really clear sign that Lake Erie is uh, crying out in the climate change era. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of switch a little bit, pivot a little bit from storm events to lake levels. Those of us who spend a lot of time on the Great Lakes, these water levels are always a fascinating situation. And what we're seeing is that situation is changing in alarming and notable ways. So in going back to 1985, 1986, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, basically all the lakes except for Lake Ontario, experienced record high water levels according to data from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. All this data that I'm going to talk about for the next few slides is from the Corps of Engineers. Then a few years later, we get to 1998-1999, Lake Michigan and Huron plunge three feet in one year because of drought. Those lakes have never fallen so far, so fast before. These are huge, some of the largest lakes in the world, and they drop three feet in one 12-month period. Truly an extraordinary event. Then the drought continues up until 2013 to the point where Michigan and Huron finally hit all-time low water level lows, a record low on Michigan and Huron in 2013. And so from that period, 1999 
to 2014. Remember, we had really high water in 85, 86, but then 1999, 2014, Superior, Michigan, and Huron all saw a record long period of low water. Never, the lakes, those lakes had never been so low so long before. And people literally, including scientists, were concerned that that was what the situation was going to be. This was basically the future had arrived. Uh, but that turned out not to be the case. And so then in 2013, 2014, the polar, morphic, polar vortex moves in uh, during the winter and Lake Superior sees this like, really fantastic ice cover. So many people think that the vast majority of the evaporation from a big lake like Lake Superior is going to happen during those hot, dry months in the summer. But in fact, a lot of evaporation occurs in the winter during those months in the winter when the lake is ice free or has un not that much ice like was the last winter um, that we just experienced. And that when you have that relative uh, low humidity, it really sucks a lot of evaporation out of the lake. But when the ice covers the lake that shuts down that evaporation and the lake's water levels can recover. And that's exactly what happens. Lake Superior experiences its fastest rise on record during that winter. Michigan Huron see the fastest, uh, the second fastest rise on record during that, during that same time period. And then a few years later, 2017, Lake Ontario shoots up four vertical feet in just six months. Again, one of the largest lakes in the world increases its water level by four vertical feet in just six months. Just truly extraordinary for uh, a, a lake geek and a water geek like me. And then not surprisingly, that same year, later on in that same year, Lake Ontario breaks its all-time high water level record in 2017 and then breaks that new record again in 2019. And then Lake Erie also breaks its all-time high-level water record in 2019. And so just to kind of recap, so from 1998 to 2013, we have one of the driest periods, if not the driest period ever in recorded history on the Great Lakes watershed. And then just a few years later, 2015 to 2019, we have the wettest five-year period ever recorded on the Great Lakes watershed. So we got this roller coaster kind of whiplash thing happening with water levels in the Great Lakes region uh, during the climate change era. So let's put this in perspective with the natural variability of the Great Lakes. So those of us who have lived along the Great Lakes for a long time know that they have always varied naturally with their lake levels. And here's a photo of the same place in 1986, during that high water period that I talked about, this is the United States Geological Survey's Hammond Bay Biological Station in Northern Lake Huron. And you can see the high water level in the photo in 1986. In fact, they had to put sheet piling in to prevent the station from eroding and falling into uh, Lake Huron. And then you fast forward to 2006, that the middle of that drought period that I talked about, and you can see how far the water level had receded there at that same biological station. This is in 2006. We didn't break the record until 2013. So this is more in that natural variability area. And so what's hard for people to understand sometimes is that since the glaciers melted 10,000 years ago, this natural variability has normal is normal in the Great Lakes watershed. And the ecosystem thrives on this natural variability. If you look at that sand and mud flat there in the 2006 photo, you can see it's starting to vegetate. So that vegetation kind of moves in during those low water level years. Birds come and they feed and nest in those areas. Other wildlife does too. And then over time, always, the lake has then rebounded. Water levels come back up. That vegetation becomes inundated by water. And that sort of bird and wildlife nursery becomes a fish nursery and small minnows and things end up in there. There might be spawn beds in, in those areas as well. And that terrestrial or land-based vegetation deteriorates and washes away and in some cases may be replaced by aquatic vegetation. Again, that's natural. And again, most of the lakes have a natural variability of six vertical feet. So if you live on a cliff, 
that's six vertical feet. But if you're on a gradually sloping shoreline, like the one shown here in the 2006 photo, that means the water level can be perhaps even 100 yards today in a high water level period than it was during the low water level period. Um, and from when I was a kid, a lot of people say, when I was a kid, the water level was like this, X, Y, Z, et cetera. And so again, that's normal. And, and the Great Lakes ecosystem thrives on that. What's different now is research is suggesting we're entering an era of water level extremes, breaking numerous records like I talked about in the process. And that is stressing the natural environment and the, the human-made environment. So we're talking about higher highs, lower lows, longer low water periods, and more rapid rises during the wet water periods, like I talked about the Lake Ontario rising four vertical feet in just six months, which is just, again, just extraordinary and was highly, highly stressful on the environment and um, the, the, the human-made infrastructure in the region. And so what does this mean? It means we're entering this new era of volatility. And so here's a quote. What this means for the Great Lakes is that we need to be prepared for extremes, whether it's extreme weather patterns, whether it's extreme water levels, whether it's extreme droughts and storms, we just need to be prepared for extremes. And this is a quote from Wendy, Wendy Legere, who's a co-chair, as you can see, from the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Adaptive Management Committee. So Wendy studies these issues on behalf of the International Joint Commission. And as you can see, she's part of the Adaptive Management Committee. This is talking about climate change adaptation, the idea that climate change is already here and it's continuing to come. And we need to learn how to adapt uh, to what climate change is bringing here in the Great Lakes and, and elsewhere. Okay, so where are water levels now? It turns out we're kind of rightly now we're right kind of in a kind of a Goldilocks moment. This is kind of a confusing chart. I'm going to walk us through it. So this is published by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They keep the key data in the United States on Great Lakes water levels. Start just by looking at this blue dotted line. That blue dotted line represents the average water level in Lake Superior over time according to the data collected by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That's the average water level. The red line is the water level that has been recorded by the Corps over recent years, going back to late 2021, then into 2022, 2023, and then the Corps also does a forecast on water levels getting into 2024 on the right-hand side of the graph. And so if you compare that red line to that blue line, you can see we're staying pretty close to the long-term average, kind of in the middle. During 2023, we had some high months in there in May and June, because at the top, you can see these different dates, different years, that's representing the all-time high water level record for those months on Lake Superior. At the bottom, you can see those water level years. Those represent the all-time low water levels for those months and in in Lake Superior. And so the the blue line again represents that kind of halfway point between the highs and the lows and the red line shows where we have been during the last couple of years and then again the core does this forecast. And so when we're looking like what's 2024 going to look like, the core is predicting if you look at the green dotted line inside the shaded red they're predicting we're almost going to be right by the blue or right time, right by the long term average. But the reason why the red is shaded and fans out is they're saying this is where we could be wrong. It shouldn't get any higher than the top of that fan or any lower than the bottom of that fan. And so the point here that I'm trying to make is when you look at all this incredible volatility that we've been through for the last you know, several years, particularly the start of this century, where it was really a roller coaster, we should enjoy and be thankful for this water level um, uh, sort of normalness that we happen to be in at this time. Okay, so the takeaways that I want everybody to have from this talk tonight is that Lake Superior is one of the fastest warming large lakes in the world, and that Superior and the other Great Lakes have entered this period of increased climate-driven volatility. 
That volatility has been marked by historic droughts, followed by historic wet periods with extreme weather events and more volatile lake levels, and that these stream extreme events are taxing the region's human and natural infrastructure, as I mentioned. Scientists and government officials and the public are still coming to grips with this new volatility. And as bad as that sounds, it's still better than what climate change is doing in many other areas of the United States. We don't have a year round fire season like we're seeing in California. We don't have a drought that's the worst in 1,200 years like we're seeing in the Colorado River watershed. We do not have persistent, long-term, ever rising water levels uh, like they're seeing with ocean uh, increases in water levels uh, on, on both coasts. So uh, that's why um, some people see this region, we're going to see, we're going to experience climate change, but sim some people see the Great Lakes region as a climate refuge going into the future. In fact, a few years ago, the New York Times had a front page story uh, highlighting Duluth, Minnesota is the most climate resilient city in the United States. So climate change, kind of a downer. I'm trying to end on an up note uh, here in the Great Lakes region. And uh, John, that's all I have. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me turn my video back on. So, Peter, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll generate some interesting dialogue around uh, all that you talked about there. I've noted a few notes, uh, a few questions that have popped up, and we'll we'll return to that, as I said, at the end of and once we're through all of our presentations. But uh, thanks very much for that. You're welcome. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on and introduce Jonathan, say a little bit more um, about Jonathan Thunder. Um, and I have to say that I think um, I first uh, really encountered Jonathan's work when I was at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. And if any of you are out there uh, and have some extra time, in between the B and the C concourses, there is an underground uh, walkway that connects those two concourses where J Jonathan has this amazing uh, huge video wall that um, plays imagery animations and sound uh, out of his uh, imagination uh, bringing bringing out um, cultural themes and one of the you're going to see a little clip of it in a minute here um, and uh, so it includes some characters that are relevant to Lake Superior and our story but I just wanted to mention that in case I forgot it, because if you're ever out there, the B and the C concourses, go underground and check that out. Um, so Jonathan uh, is a member of the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe, uh, although he says he really grew up in the Twin Cities, but it has uh, cultural and family ties there um, to the reservation. He studied at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe and at the Art Institute International in Minneapolis. Um, and his work, as you will see, is, is um, both digital and he's also a painter, so uh, kind of exploring different disciplines. Uh, his work has been featured in many state, regional, and national exhibitions, uh, the airport being just one of them, uh, won multiple awards and honors. And I'm going to read a little blurb from his artist statement. I encourage you to check out his website. Um, you'll find the artist statement there. Uh, in uh, There's more to it than what I'm going to read. I'm just going to read the first part of it. So he says, I grew up reading Mad Magazine, collecting garbage pail kids, riding skateboards with elaborate odd designs on the deck, listening to Public Enemy, Rage Against Machine, Tom Waits, and watching MTV. The Twin Cities is my hometown, but I was born on the Red Lake Indian Reservation, home to the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe. These two worlds are integrated to me, yet far apart. Both worlds inform my perspective, my work, and my outlook to the future. Um, so to introduce some further, I'm going to play a clip from the Sea Change for Lake Superior documentary. And um, this is a, uh, a segment where Jonathan and another Ojibwe artist we've had the pleasure of working with uh, for some time, Carl Gaboy are both uh, uh, presenting artwork they've created um, about Michi Bijou, which you'll you'll learn who that is in a moment here. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this little clip. Ooh. So Sarah, it looks like my, I no longer have the, 
sound options. So I hopefully this will work. Is there, uh, before I do, Sarah, is there anything you can do to switch to enable that for me? Do you know? Yeah, click click out and try it again. Okay. See if we can get some sound. Yeah, there, we got it back. Wonderful, okay. thank you. Okay, so here we go. Uh, okay. In Lake Superior, the great panther, the guardian of the copper at Isle Royal, has his lair underwater and is always associated with water. They used to have ceremonies to the great panther where they would make offerings and sink them to the great panther that was down under the water. Because, of course, he controlled the storms. So that if you were a commercial fisherman or a, just even traveling on Lake Superior, you did that in order to ensure safe travel. You never take Lake Superior for granted. You never trust it. It can be dangerous, can be deadly. After hearing a little more stories about the Great Lakes, I always just thought it was really intriguing to think about that because I lived right next to Lake Superior. And any time that I was near it, you know, I felt the power and the energy of the lake itself. In my mind, Mission Bijou is a protector of the water. Big giant cat, you know, sort of embodies that spirit. Given that it's a protector of the water, to me that sort of makes it a little noble. So even if it's presented in some stories as being kind of a menace, uh, I see it as having its own story and its own reasoning. One of the themes in my work is that I, I like to look at these characters at a different perspective. And I want to frame the Mishibiju. There can be a parent, you know, to a cub. A lot of uh, Ojibwe medicine bags have the image of the panther with a kind of zigzag line on top, meaning it's underwater. And they show often two of them, two different colors. So one panther is evil and can poison you can blow pestilence out of its mouth, kill you. But the other one has all kinds of knowledge that if you give them the, give him the right gifts and the right honor, he'll give you all kinds of wisdom. Okay. So, Jonathan, glad to have you with us. Please uh, take it away. Thank you, John. That's a uh, that's a beautiful clip. Thank you for the introduction and uh, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation to be a part of this project. I'm I'm always uh, surprised at where my art work kind of leads me to in the world, and uh, a lot of times. It leads me to like-minded folks like yourself, Peter and Sarah, which is, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing for a studio artist who uh, studio practices are very solo, um, <clears throat> often uh, isolated careers. And when I'm invited to be a part of a project that's much bigger than myself, it, uh, it's always fun. Like I, I always learn a lot. And thank you, Peter, for that presentation. That was uh, a lot to think about. And um, I can uh, maybe reflect some of those thoughts and some of the artwork that I'm about, I'm about to share for my presentation. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Let's see, I think I'm just going to go ahead and share my desktop. 
And we will move this to the side if possible. Get this out of here. There, I think we're all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, so about 10 years ago, I moved to Duluth, Minnesota on a friend's recommendation. I had been here a couple times for work uh, doing ex exhibits with um, the American Indian Community Housing Organization and uh, the University of Wisconsin Superior. And I, I didn't know a lot about the area or the lake. Um, I'd lived in Minneapolis for uh, quite some time. The only time that I lived outside of Minneapolis was when I moved to New Mexico, uh, which is interesting because uh, I remember my first summer in New Mexico, looking out on the horizon in the parking lot of the dorms that I was staying in uh, where I went to college and seeing a mushroom cloud on the mountains uh, to the, uh, I guess that would be the West. <clears throat> and at first I thought, you know, maybe a nuke had gone off or something at one of those secret military facilities out there in New Mexico. But a friend of mine quickly explained it to me that almost every year they deal with fires. Uh, a lot of stuff burns up, air quality gets bad. And, um, it's just part of living in a dry climate. <clears throat> Some of the artwork that I'm going to show tonight is about experiencing that here in the last few years next to Lake Superior, uh, which is an interesting thing to me, um, being that I live next to one of the largest bodies of water, or maybe the largest body of fresh water, you know, in the world. <clears throat> so as I became familiar with the uh, area. I got to know a lot of people and a lot about the culture that lives here. Um, my family is Ojibwe and uh, both my parents are from Red Lake, but we were very uh, busy. I guess you could say we we're very urban. Um, there was a lot going on. And the only time that I heard stories about this uh, mythology that I'll talk about and these um, tribal stories is in books. I read books by Basil Johnston, uh, um, some University of Minnesota papers that I had come across at the library. <clears throat> and it was just, uh, you know, it was just on paper. And when I moved to Duluth, I found out that these stories are still shared. They're still alive. Uh, there are large events where people gather and share these stories about the lake, the sky, and the land. And, uh, how uh, they reflect on this. And um, I consider myself somewhat of a tourist, I guess, being more of an art, uh, identifying with more of the art culture than I guess I know about Ojibwe culture, but I like to, I like to absorb things and uh, push it out through my work. So I think it was around 2017, uh, curator at the Tweed called me into a meeting and said, you know, we want you to do an installation. The Tweed Museum is in Duluth at the University of Minnesota Duluth. We want you to do an installation uh, using the um, Nelson Collection case, and it can be anything you want. You know, just look at our art collection, get some ideas. Uh, what do you want to say? And I thought about the stories that I had heard in that, uh, in this region that I live in. And there was somewhat of a secrecy around these stories. Like you would get in there and uh, they could only be t told in a certain time of year. Cell phones were asked to be turned off and put away. Uh, no one was allowed to record these stories. They were only for oral um, sharing. And often a special storyteller would be brought in to share these stories. So somebody was handing me a microphone to create a public work of art. And I knew that there were some thoughts about bringing this stuff to the surface. So uh, I wanted to tell these stories, these stories that 
had been hushed. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's what causes um, the idea that these should be kept secret because for years, you know, it was, it was a bad thing to uh, practice Anishinaabe or tribal culture. And uh, it kind of went underground, but I wanted to bring it back to the surface, so to speak. And one of the stories that I had learned the most about in this area that was really intriguing to me because, you know, who doesn't love a dragon story was the Mishibiju. Um, I think I first started looking at the uh, rock uh, art on the North shore of Lake Superior. And then I started asking some local friends and they would give me little tidbits like, um, you know, when you hear the Mishibiju uh, or when you hear the ice cracking at the end of winter, that's the Mishibiju, you know, like banging its head against the, you know, the ice. Just cool stuff like that that I thought was really fun storytelling. And I started to make notes and compile a, a list of ways to represent this lake entity uh, that was in a lot of cool stories. And one of the things that I understood about this creature was that it would make problems for people who abused the resources of the lake. And I thought that really lined up with a lot of uh, ideas that I had about my work. Um, I think about how we treat our environment, how we, it takes care of us. So in turn, we should try our best, you know, to take care of it. And uh, I saw this creature less as a dragon, uh and more as uh, a protector you know somebody who nurtures and um who's the bad guy in this situation us so uh that uh, that was a fun story to work with um like all uh mythological characters throughout art history i wanted to create a bust of this character to be preserved and it was uh entertaining to me uh to think about some of the stories that i heard about this you know is that the the legends are centuries old only told orally uh i think there may be some artwork on birch bark somewhere about this stuff but i wanted to use cutting ed edge technology to bring this story into our century into our time to bring it forward and say you know this story is still relevant it's still here it's still a story about how we need to respect the lake and uh i'm going to use modern tools to tell it so that it will last moving into the future for however long this piece will last and uh this is a mishabiju bust that is now currently in the permanent collection of the tweed museum of art uh i don't know they might bring it out during a exhibit about sculptures. But at the time I displayed it, as you can see with the uh, the installation that I had created at the Tweed Museum. So telling stories is a huge part of my practice. I am a filmmaker as well. Uh, visual storytelling is one way that I identify when people ask me, what do you exactly do? Um, and that way I can umbrella my, my films, my paintings, my uh, installations, sculptures, et cetera. <clears throat> but you know, my paintings, uh, films are expensive to make. So my paintings are like poor man's filmmaking for me. <laughs> and uh, um, They're much cheaper than hiring a film crew and dozens of, uh, staff and actors to put together your story and i can make anything i want from anything i want and in this piece that you i think you'll see it in uh the film um there's a lot of symbolism here about the lake and about some of the things that are near and dear to me uh and this character here um well i'll start here this uh this piece is called uncle harvey's mausoleum and the thing that I found interesting about Uncle Harvey's mausoleum is the story about it is sort of a man versus the lake kind of story where uh, this crafty businessman, um, he wanted to create something more convenient 
to uh, outsmart, you know, the lakes, um, kind of uh, slowing down of things coming in. He was bringing in sand from the Apostle Islands to develop Duluth. And the lake quickly overtook this structure, which was connected to, uh, I think, a, like a dock that people would haul, you know, stuff ashore on. And nowadays, it's just a, p a pile of rubble that people dive off of. You know, and this thing is made of concrete, but it's no match for Lake Superior. Uh, lake Superior is definitely <laughs> lives up to its name. It's uh, pretty superior. Uh, in summer of 20, I want to say 2021, we started to get, uh, it might have even been 2020, we started to get uh, air quality warnings outside, um, lots of smoke, haze, and uh, things were catching on fire real easy. And one of the markers that I noticed uh, was ice cream. A lot of my friends were buying ice cream because it was so hot. When I first moved to Duluth 10 years ago, you maybe had to turn on your air conditioner for one week in August. It was like, I remember thinking like, wow, I only had this thing on about eight days this year. <clears throat> and uh, last summer, I think I had my air conditioner on most of the summer. You know, it was like 80, 90 degrees. So in 10 years, a lot has changed here. And... um this ice cream melting, sort of becoming Lake Superior, is occupied by a lot of characters. Uh, there's a bear wearing a rabbit's mask, which is the uh, kind of uh, bear in my symbolism is sort of the, I guess, medicine keeper, the thing that tells us, you know, what's good for us. And the rabbit is kind of the trickster. So um, being humanoid, you know, this this bear kind of represents us and we are our own tricksters in this scenario. Um, I was just having a son uh, uh, or we were working on having a son, actually. So I painted this little character here, kind of checking out the world, sort of wondering if he wants to actually come here. Um, this is my wife's clan in Ojibwe culture. We have uh, clans that represent our family. And she is a crane clan singing to the um, baby auditing our planet. And off in the distance, you see a lighthouse, which is, in my mind, a symbol of, you know, like finding safe passage home. And I hope, you know, whatever's going on with our planet, that we can find a safe way to navigate it as a people, as a shared humanity together. And uh, it's something I think about. So it goes into my work. Um, this is a kind of a fun piece that I made. Uh, I remember thinking about the water. Um, I made this piece after coming back from a few visits to support the folks at the Standing Rock uh, protest where they were um, trying to stop the North Dakota, the uh, North Dakota mm -hmm. access pipeline from coming through their water system ways. And uh, this, pe this piece is called Defend the Sacred. And I remember thinking about Jack Link's jerky commercials where they're messing with Sasquatch. And in this painting, we're messing with Sasqu Sasquatch's water. So uh, we better watch out. <clears throat> there is a, a local organization that has recently commissioned me to create a few murals for their office space. And uh, they said, you know, we just want something from you. Um, we need some big paintings for our office spaces. Uh, you just make whatever you make and let us know, you know, like what you're thinking and we'll get it set up. So their office space overlooks Lake Superior, overlooks Canal Park. And uh, they have a meeting room where a couple of these are going to go called the Lake Superior Meeting Room. <clears throat> so, of course, I had to go with the Mishibiju, and uh, I wanted to frame the Mishibiju in a light where the Mishibiju is a nurturing parent and looking after its own because that's something that we don't uh, always think about when we're arguing about what the best solution is. 
<clears throat> we sort of other each other when we're trying to find a way through these difficult times. And uh, really at the end of a day, um, you know, we really just want to do what's best for our next generation. At least I would hope so. <clears throat> this is a play on a couple pieces, uh, Whistler's Mother and uh, The Great Wave sort of merged together to uh, create a painting about a uh, mother figure wearing a cat hat, uh, kind of a nod to the Mission Bijou spirit and weaving Lake Superior. And I lived on the shore, of right on the shore, literally right on the shore in a house, not on a rock, on in a house uh, overlooking Lake Superior. And I remember just looking at the waves and just thinking how powerful and beautiful uh, Lake Superior was and that, uh, you know, it was something definitely to be respected. So that piece is a nod to um, wh where, in my mind, we sit in the hierarchy with this lake. There's another piece uh, about the Mishibiju. Um, and I keep saying that for those that might not know, it means uh, the Great Links. Other terms for it are the underwater panther. And uh, it is, um, it's kind of the Lake Superior Dragon. You know, it pops up in uh, fantasy art. And if you Google it, you'll see that all kinds of digital creators have rendered uh, variations of this critter. Um, and then this one, this creature has just come back from a battle with uh, mankind and is going to treat himself to a nice couple scoops of ice cream. This is an adaptation of Mishibiju celebrating his birthday and uh, having a cup of espresso with his secret love. And this last piece, uh, well, it's not the last piece, but it's the, one of the last murals. Um, <clears throat> it's called Time. You know, and it's 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 also about generational uh, caretaking. It's about parenthood, and uh, as a parent myself, you know, I th I think about what the world's going to be like when my son, you know, is uh, twenty, and uh, how the air quality is going to be. You know, what the water is going to be like, stuff like that, and uh, what can I do currently to help that. Uh, be okay you know there's a lot of uh things to think about when i spend my you know dollar bill and um this piece is uh generally about that <clears throat> in this piece uh the mishibiju is kind of like the he's basically the pink panther and the pink panther was a jewel thief and uh in this painting the earth is the jewel and um, the theme of this painting is that there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of careless decisions that are being made that are not helping uh, us to try to preserve our lakes and um, the people that own those things, in my opinion, they have stolen that power, you know, and as the people, uh, it's up to us to steal it back. You know, they're not going to give it back to us. We can never afford to buy it back from them. So we have to steal it back. <clears throat> and this was uh, what I would consider maybe my last painting about the Mishibiju. I feel like I had, uh, and this is done probably about a month ago, kind of run the gamut of ideas. Uh, I was sitting in my studio thinking about what it has meant to me to live with this spirit of you know the protector of the lake in my most sacred space which is my painting studio and uh how it's affected me to really think about this this uh this idea of you know an underwater panther the uh sort of i guess um ethical undertones you know that the under the underwater panther embodies and just uh you know it was like a, a self-portrait of me just saying thank you and it's been powerful to uh tackle this subject matter with all respect and uh 
on to next on to new stuff on to new stuff um but yeah i am uh happy to say that at the airport you can see a rendering of the uh exhibit that started at the tweed had its origin here in duluth minnesota and uh, when i first walked into this tunnel this is what it looked like over here you can see uh, sam fuentes who is the amazing curator at arts at msp that uh, was kind enough to uh, invite me help me um, find resources and put this together for uh, people who are coming through that concourse and a lot of those planes go out to northern minnesota uh, a lot of those flying to duluth united and delta um, so they'll hear about the lake, they'll hear about the sky, they'll hear about the land up here before getting on their plane. They'll also hear Ojibwe language. Um, and if they see like the word buju on the door of a coffee shop before they walk in, you know, they might actually know what that means. So I'll wrap it up there with just a little animation. I didn't have the budget to print another set of uh, busts for the airport so what i did was i animated these busts to look like living marble sculptures and uh it's just something that i have always been interested in my practice it's something that i've always incorporated into my work and it was uh so much fun to bring it to the public and i hope that people learn about the mishibiju and what it means to the great lakes and uh, some of the incredible stories that I've heard um, here myself, you know, that have inspired me in my artwork. So thank you. And I will, I will wrap it up there. All right. Um, well, Jonathan, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I had not seen most of those images of Mishibiju. I didn't realize the, um, you know, the extent to which you've been uh, working on uh, that theme. So that's very cool. And, and thanks again for sharing that. Um, I'm going to share a little bit more uh, kind of building off of uh, what you've heard here in terms of uh, where we're going with our um, work on Lake Superior, This how we are integrating um, the contributions that Peter and Jonathan have made um, to the, the media that we are developing, just so you have a sense of that. So um, both, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Peter and Jonathan are both featured uh, in our uh, documentary, A Sea Change for Superior, The Warming of the World's Largest Lake. And I'll share a link to that uh, for you in a minute. We've just uh, posted it publicly online today. So the whole documentary, it's an hour long, is available for viewing. And I'll show you that link in a minute. And the story, as we've developed it, really uh, brings multiple voices, multiple perspectives into looking at this question of um, the warming of the lake. That was, you know, I became aware of that uh, fact that uh, the, the largest lake in the world is also one of the fastest warming lakes in the world. And immediately it just got me thinking about, well, what does that mean? You know, what does that for a lake that's so famously cold, um, Lake Superior unwilling to give up its dead because the waters are so cold. Um, what does it mean that it's warming? What does it mean for the natural systems of the lake? What does it mean for the communities along uh, the, the shores of the lake? What does it mean uh, really for the legacy, just the cultural legacy uh, of Lake Superior. So that the documentary explores that question and it it celebrates the legacy of Lake Superior, what's extraordinary about it, what are the ways that it is um, uh, extraordinary, uh, how is it changing now, and what are the impacts on natural systems. And then we have a strong focus at the end. The, the, the story is told really in three segments, the third segment, being a uh, stewardship so uh okay uh, climate is changing the lake is warming what are things people can do to uh, try and mitigate some of these issues uh, so we look at the, all those questions and there's probably 10 different uh shorter stories that are woven together within the whole documentary so now that it's completed we will be taking those 10 segments and uh dispersing them into this 
um, multiple strategy we've developed for uh, raising awareness uh, about Lake Superior. It's a, a implementation and a campaign that involves multiple elements. So on the left here, we have there we have a network of these multimedia gallery kiosks, really large format, a multi-touch. Uh, museum quality kiosks, uh, about 30 of them right now. They're in all the major state parks along the North Shore. They're in the major interpretive centers and museums, Maritime Visitor Center and Canal Park, uh, multiple resorts. Uh, Odyssey Resorts is one of our sponsors. We've got them in four or five of the Odyssey Resorts. And we've also expanded that network. Uh, they're also in the um, interstate um, highway rest areas along I-35 between Duluth and the Twin Cities, there are some outdoor stores in the Twin Cities. So um, that's been a major emphasis. And then we've, we call that the multimedia gallery. Then we have a pocket gallery, which is a smartphone app, which is free. Uh, it has all that same content, but being a smartphone app, it knows where you are and it can take you to some of the destinations that we profile. And then we've taken all that content again and optimized it for use in the classroom uh, with a program we call Waters to the Sea. And we've done that around the country. Uh, our Lake Superior version has all this same content again. And then finally, uh, working with PBS North in Duluth, uh, producing a series of documentaries. Last year, we did one on the night sky, uh, Northern Night Starry Skies. Um, and that's also available on our website for viewing. And we've integrated all of the stories in that documentary in all these different tools. And we're, as I say, we're going to do the same thing with the Sea Change program as well. And then the other two parts of the six part strategy, uh, we work with educators. So we've developed um, an institute uh, for the first time offered on the Saint, in the St. Louis River estuary last June. We're going to be doing the same thing again this year. So uh, any of you listening to this, if you're a teacher and would like to be a part of that, you're more than welcome to participate um, and you'll be getting information about that as well. And then number six, there is our Adopt a Storm Drain program. And this is a national program that we run from our center. Uh, it is There are different varied uh, programs like this around the country where uh, citizens are encouraged, if you live in an urban area, to reduce pollution that goes into the storm drains in front of, you know, along the sides of the streets, in front of your house and so forth. Ours is the largest program in the nation. Um, and uh, we have it up and down both coasts, uh, up and down the Mississippi River, extensively in Minnesota, uh, Duluth, and communities up and down the North Shore are, are participating. So this is something you, you sign up, you adopt your storm drain, you give it a name, and then you pledge to keep pollution out of, out of uh, storm drain, including grass clippings and leaves, which actually turn out to be significant nutrients. And the, the issue is that uh, anything that goes into the storm drain is not treated. Uh, it just goes directly into the nearest water body. And so along the North Shore, South Shore, that's going to be in Lake Superior. And with the increase of algal blooms, uh, which are, uh, as Peter was talking about, are happening uh, due to the warming of the lake uh, for the first time, this is an important strategy for reducing some of those impacts. So this is, this is kind of our combined um, uh, strategy and how we're going to be incorporating this information. This is the uh, web link for the Sea Change documentary. And Sarah, maybe if you can pop that into the chat, you'll, we will also send you all these links as a follow-up as well. But uh, cgee.hamlin-hamlin.org uh, slash sea change. So uh, you're welcome to explore that. Um, so with that, I am going to stop sharing and um, we'll, we'll entertain some questions for uh, folks, Peter, if you want to you turn on your um, camera again, if you want, uh, so folks can see you. And I've been tr tracking some uh, questions that have popped up in the course of um, the, your presentations. Uh, those of you who are participating, if you have further questions, go ahead and add them into the chat or the q and I'll be keeping an eye on that. So uh, maybe starting with um, uh, Peter, one question that came up um, was the reference to, you were talking about storm events, these major storm events that have occurred. And as they are commonly described, uh, when they're severe enough, uh, the terms that you used, a 500 year storm event or a 1000 year storm event, that is something you see commonly as people describe these major events. The question, which is an interesting one, I had not really 
thought about is that um, that uh, you know our storm data, the questioner asked, really would only go back to the end of the last century. So how can we say with any certainty, you know, that an event such as the storms of 2012 or 16 or 18, you know, you know, is it how do you how can that be justified as a 500 year or 1000 year storm event if our data only goes back uh, a portion of that distance? Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question. And as as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a journalist. My expertise in is in translation and translating the science to a lay audience. And the 500 year storm event, the thousand year storm event are scientific terms. And so this is a great question for the scientists to figure out how do we quantify these big storm events so that journalists like me can then report that back to the lay people, the average people who are trying to interpret these things as well. So I appreciate the question. It's a great question, but it's really a question for the scientists to figure out how do we quantify these major storm events? At the moment, this is the best way that they have found to do that. And uh, my guess is, I don't know the person who asked the question, my guess is they're probably a scientist and that this reflects the debate in the scientific community about in the era of climate change, how do we talk about these storm events in a way that a lay audience, policymakers, and those of us who are trying to mitigate and adapt to climate change can do so. So it's a great question. I appreciate it. But I, as a journalist, I'm not the one. I'm parroting the language of the scientific community. You know, and I guess I would add to that if I know I know we have some scientists uh, who are on this call because I know a few of these folks. So if people have thoughts about this or any of the other questions, um, feel free to enter those in as well. And we'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, uh, and so we'll try and share those with with others. In fact, uh, I see one of our scientist friends has asked another question. Uh, saying, I'm interested in how much uh, the water levels can be controlled in each lake and how they are connected. I remember in Lake Ontario, how upset folks were when the plan uh, with plan 2014 for water levels. Yeah, so uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm and this is a <laughs> this is a very perceptive question from somebody who understands the entire Great Lakes watershed. And so I'm gonna try and simplify it as much as I can. So we have a five lake ecosystem. Lake Superior is the headwaters lake in that ecosystem. It is partially controlled at Sault Ste. Marie. So the water levels in Lake Superior aren't fundamentally controlled at Sault Ste. Marie, but they're partially controlled with the lock and dam system at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, two towns with the same name in the two different cities in the two different countries. Then you go through and the water flows into Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, flows into Lake Erie, uncontrolled by humans. And then it flows over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario. And then suddenly, dramatically and very differently for the ecosystem, we get to the St. Lawrence River and there are big dams, really big dams. And so what we see on Lake Ontario Naturally, pre-settlement of Europeans, Lake Ontario had the greatest water level fluctuation of all the Great Lakes. I talked about the fact that most of the Great Lakes are around six feet between the ultimate uh, record high and record lows. Lake Superior's closer to four feet. But Lake Ontario was the one that whiplashed the most naturally, and its ecosystem uh, was adapted to that. Then the dams come in on the St. Lawrence Seaway during the last century. And Lake Ontario suddenly becomes the least variable lake. And the wetlands and all those places that were flushed by these highs and lows and highs and lows, they became static ecosystems. We had cattail monocultures, so we didn't have the natural variability in the wetlands that we used to have before these dams came in and, and the water levels were controlled by the International Joint Commission. I referenced this during my talk, but for some of the people, International Joint Commission is a very important organization formed in the early 1900s by the federal governments of the United States and Canada to resolve transboundary water disputes all along the U.S.-Canada border. 
and the International Joint Commission, working with representatives from the Canada and the United States, decide now, humans, decide now what the water level shall be on Lake Ontario. It's the main lake where that happens. A little bit that happens with the Lake Superior Border Control at Sault Ste. Marie, but it really happens on Lake Ontario. And so what we have now is in plan 2014, uh, I'm, again, I'm trying to make this simple, John. It's a, it's a great question. It's a complicated question. But is there lessons learned on Lake Ontario for all of this? So what we have now in plan 2014 is there so many different people, humans, arguing some want high water, some want low water, some want medium water. And they're all lobbying the International Joint Commission and through plan 2014 tried to resolve these varying arguments because there's some people like, Get rid of the dams. We want this natural variability again that the lake loved. And the shipping industry and others, people who have marinas and docks, they don't, humans don't really like natural variability. The lake has always had it. And so oh, humans, you put in a dock, you put in a marina, dang, you want that water level. You build on the lake and you build maybe too close to the lake. You want that static natural, uh, that static uh, lake level, not natural variability. And so there's a debate about, can we harness these lakes, man? Can we take the natural variability out and make them better for humans? Or do we let them rock and roll like they always used to, even with climate change? And most people today still fall on the side, using Lake Ontario as an example, is let's let these lakes be, even in climate change, and let them be what they want to be. Let's not try and harness them. We're talking about billions of dollars in engineering investment that would it take. You'd have to put a lock and dam on every lake throughout the system. We're talking about tons of money binationally with Canada and United States. And mostly, especially the environmental community is like, let's let these lakes be. Let's let them do what they're going to do. Climate change is, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, rocking and rolling even more. But most people today don't think the solution is to harness the lakes, let humans decide, because ultimately then what happens is the water levels tend to be controlled for the people who have the loudest voice. And usually it's not the lakes. It's the humans who live around the lakes. Hmm. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, your question kind of prompts one that I was thinking of, Jonathan, during your talk um a little bit you're talking about the you know kind of the contrast between <clears throat> uh the human desire to control things and we don't like natural by variability peter you were just saying this and yet you know there, that is a feature of nature you know a lot of these systems are really dynamic and uh variable and jonathan i'm thinking about uh again just really struck by the incredible variety of images you have associated with monsieur bijou you know the pink panther i mean you know it's like i hadn't seen that or we hadn't seen that coming or you know anticipated that and uh you know and and i know thinking back to what uh carl gaboy talked about where you know he's saying he kind of talks about this dual nature of monsieur bijou as being uh you know on the one hand evil and capable of killing you but also possessing great knowledge and you've talked about you know kind of the the uh you know, it can be fierce uh, as a character, but also um, you you tend to think of him as a protector. And so I'm kind of wondering the incredible diversity in the images that you showed. Uh, I'm just curious how, how much of that comes from the diversity of stories you've heard. I mean, is this do you hear multiple perspectives about this character um, in your conversations and in learning about these cultural traditions? Or is it like is you know i'm just curious where those images are coming from for you and you know how that relates to what you see as the you know kind of what this character is like you know uh a lot of the stuff that i make it it's uh in the realm of adaptation of what i the very little that i know about this legend um i would say what i know is uh like if that giant cat peeked his eyes up out of the water, you know, and looked at you and then went away versus what it seems like Carl Gowboy uh, understands, which is, you know, he has quite a library of stories 
I'd love to sit down with him for like a week and just, you know, buy him coffee and dinner and all kinds of stuff and just try to see how much of that he would share with me. Um, being a storyteller uh, who likes to create contemporary stories, I've taken the small amount of information that I know and I try to incorporate them into stories that I've heard uh, or seen on TV, you know, as a kid, um, on in movies, read in books, and incorporate that. To me, that's a way of bringing these uh, stories together, you know, because they're all, in my world, connected. You know, like I try to live uh, as much as I can um, as a human being who is uh, subject to the same um energy systems as everybody else you know but like in my mind i always am searching for you know the right answer the right question stuff like that and that's these how i explore these variations of the mission bijou are my own creations mm -hmm. my own okay. questions really you know, just me asking questions to myself in my studio right right um and you mentioned uh becoming a parent a couple of times and i'm curious is your how has becoming a parent uh impacted your work would you say like what what have you noticed about either things you notice or things you want to create stories you want to tell and that kind of thing well i have to work a lot faster and uh be a lot more efficient these days <laughs> um but I, I would say that my uh, the arrival of my son has definitely um, solidified, you know, what I think is a good path for the usefulness of my work. Like I try to, uh, I guess I try to ask the right questions in my work and not entertain, um, you know, artwork for the sake of ego or uh, shock value for the sake of shock value. Um, obviously in a studio you have to play so a lot of that when you see one of my paintings there's play in there there is you know like some some stuff that's just for fun but there's also you know like some serious notes too you know I, I try to definitely uh, use my gift wisely and uh, I don't pretend to be um, I think, you know, like throughout history, artists have been uh, given some kind of places being, you know, like super intelligent or something like that. I'm just like an observer, you know, like, and I have snarky commentary. And if it comes across as witty at all, it's probably because it's true, you know, and not everything that I make, you know, hits that note, but I try to make enough stuff along those lines where some of them, you know, some of them hit as truth great okay um wonderful well actually i see we are just about out of time so i think we're going to have to leave it at that peter and jonathan once again uh very much appreciate you taking time to to share with our audience and share with us and we look forward to doing more with you in the future it was my pleasure all right yeah thank you i appreciate thank it you, it's everyone. good to be a part of this okay. with all you guys okay very good. Well, we'll sign off for tonight then. Thanks again.